Welcome to the .NET Talk Show with your hosts, Cam Soper, David Pye, and not the Scott we deserve, but the Scott we needed, Scott Addy. The .NET Doc Show starts now. That never gets old. It does not. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, uh, awesome. Go ahead. Take it away, Jason. All right. Oh, welcome to the Wisconsin .NET User Group. Um, we have a special session with the .NET Doc Show, and David Pine's going to be talking about building their Blazor app. Uh, Blazor is a pretty cool technology, and I'm sure he'll get into it. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Um, we also have some exciting news. As you can see on the top right, we have a new logo for the Wisconsin.net user group. I know David Pine was very vocal the last time we met that says I should update that. So <laughs> I took up his challenge. And now we're in. <laughs> oh, it, it is much improved, and I, I hate to call attention to that, but uh, I, I like it. It's it's good. It's very well done. The other one, it was a classic, though, right? Everyone loved really? the classic. It was, I mean, how how old was the original logo? Uh, 2002, so 18 years. 18 years. I mean, yeah. that's like a throwback. There should be hats <laughs> for that. That should be like a, a giveaway. Flat build Wisconsin.net user group hats. Yep. yep. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, so do we have any sponsors for this one or I know normally like what we would do is we'd get together, there'd be pizza, mm -hmm. there'd be a little bit of socializing and then we would yeah. go about and have our thing. So what's, what's, what's yeah. different today? So we do have a sponsor. The sponsor is new resources. Um, they're basically sponsoring the event in the group and they make the meetings and stuff happen. So, um, I'll send out some more information about some of their career opportunities that they have and, and reach out to me if you have any questions. I can help out. So that's what we have, Dave. David. Awesome. Um, so one thing that we try to do is we really want to encourage everyone um, in this virtual environment to feel empowered to ask questions. So if you're watching right now, you have the opportunity to uh, do the live chat. And as you ask questions, um, they will, sh you know, we can, we can propagate them and show them here on screen and we can address them. So I want this to be more of an open dialogue. I know that, you know, uh, since we can't do this in person, it's a lot more difficult uh, with the virtual setting, but let's make the most of it and let's try to be interactive and engage. And this is for your benefit. So at any point in time, if you have questions, uh, if you wanna you know, throw peanuts at us or whatever, feel free to interrupt, right? Um, so that's what we're here for. But I'm, I'm joined today. Uh, I wanna take this opportunity to thank um, Cam Soper and Scott Addy for willingly, you know, jumping on and saying, hey, you know, we'll be there to help out and support. And um, the backstory to uh, the show is, in fact, uh, Scott and Cam and I, we were um, at uh, an event uh, internal to Microsoft and it was called DevRel Camp. And what it is, is basically all of developer relations gets together uh, in Washington and it happens at the beginning of every year. Um, I think it was like February. And it's just to get together, socialize and, and kind of, you know, talk about plans, things you've done and stuff like that and celebrate all those things together. Uh, and when we got together, we actually talked about how it would be so, you know, cool to do a live stream. And, you know, we've been inspired by so many people doing those sorts of things. Uh, it made sense that, you know, hey, we could start this. And we did it very, um, uh, unofficially, uh, <laughs> and we did it for months unofficially. In fact, um, we just recently became legitimized uh, to where now we're a part of the official .NET Live TV, which hasn't even been formally announced. So uh, really cool stuff happening there. So we're super excited. Um, but I'm going to share my screen because I'm not much of one for having a slide deck, but I tried preparing something. So I'm going to press this button. Oops. I'm going to press the wrong button. I'm going to press this one. Wait for it. I'm assuming you can see that. So uh, this talk here is uh, building the .NET Docs show website. And obviously, uh, if you don't know me, hopefully you do by now. My name is David, David Pine. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm the seventh iteration of David Pines, apparently. So David Pine 7. Uh, yeah, there's always humorous things there. Uh, ask Cam. He always likes making fun of me, as does Scott. Uh, I maintain a, a, a 
a blog site at davidpine.net. Um, I, I, I haven't really done much on it lately, uh, but there is a bunch of still you know relevant content out there. Feel free to check it out. Uh, and all of the source code, all of the things that I'm doing in the open um, are at iEvangelist. So uh, including the show. So the, the docs uh, website show, you can go check it out and it's there. And uh, hopefully you'll feel empowered to contribute to it or post issues or just take a look behind the scenes and kind of see how things were done um, and, and, you know, poke fun. Um, so I talked about uh, a bit of the, you know, kind of the backstory, the, the why, you know, we were inspired uh, collectively to, to come up and, and do this live streaming thing. And um, I talked jokingly about how we didn't really have permission. It was very, very much the truth that we didn't have permission initially. It's, we just kind of did it on our own time. Uh, and we made it uh, everything that we wanted to be. And um, so it's been organically evolving over time. And uh, the first couple episodes that we had, and I know Scott and Cam will, uh, you know, verify this for you but it was it was rough it was rough going uh it, but it was fun it was entertaining right it was a way for us to kind of collaborate and in the midst of this global pandemic the timing uh was right it, and the stars aligned and uh we've been we've been doing it now for a while and uh it's super uh exciting and it, i get excited about every single show and uh so it's hopefully something that you know people are um taking some sort of value away from any of the shows, learning something new or, or just having a chance to kind of sit down and um, interact with us. And uh, so the show has uh, segments now. So the first uh, little bit is kind of an introduction to what the show is about. And uh, we introduce our guests and we'll typically have three hosts. And then we have a checkup segment, which is about five minutes where we kind of hyper focus into a doc. And this is where a bunch of the confusion comes in. And so if you've ever watched the .NET doc shows, uh, you might have assumed it's explicitly just about um, the docs. And it's not. Uh, even though that we work for uh, the docs platform on you know, Microsoft docs, that's not all we're uh, hyper-focused on. We actually do a lot of other things um, that are just .NET you know, centric. And the .NET docs is actually a play on words. And we should really get better at our marketing. But if you've noticed our logo, it's got like the stethoscope and uh, like the, the mask and all that. So it's like an actual doctor. So we consider ourselves to be doctors of .NET. So that's kind of where, you know, the story and the evolution of where uh, we've come and where we're hope uh, we're going. Um, so now for the meat of this, again, very few slides uh, is the demo. And this is what I like talking about. It's just really opening up Visual Studio and walking through all the different moving parts of the code, talking about Blazor, uh, server side, uh, ASP.NET Core, the dependency injection aspects to it, the C Sharp 8 features, um, Azure, the Logic Apps, Key Vault, all the things, right? And just kind of going from there. So this is where we encourage people to ask questions. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm gonna stop sharing this part. I'm going to share Visual Studio. Uh, so one thing I like calling attention to is the fact that there's this presentation mode. So a lot of people aren't really familiar with that. But if you zoom in and hover down here, um, when you go on uh, Visual Studio 2019, oh, I can't zoom and do that. Come on. <laughs> uh, click. There we go. There's this presentation mode. Um, that's available. And this is actually an extension from Mads Christensen. Uh, and he's building all kinds of extensions for Visual Studio proper. But uh, what this does is allows you to have a uh, settings that are separate from your standard local profile settings. Um, and you can basically specify different settings that are explicit to uh, a presentation version. That's why it says demo up here. Um, and so I have, you know, my high contrast, I've got my font, I got it blown up ridiculously sized so that it's presentable and consumable. Uh, so that's one thing I like calling attention to. Um, but we have a very simple, like if you were just to imagine doing file, um, uh, project, new, you know, new project. Uh, so we, we have a blazer server side, um, application and 
there's a lot of confusion around Blazor server side versus uh, Blazor WebAssembly. And so to be very clear about that, this is the hosting model that uh, really differentiates the two. So uh, server side is uh, very uh, synonymous with like uh, Razor pages or MVC um, or even like, you know, historical web forms. And what that means is, you know, a request comes over the wire from a client and the um, ASP.NET Core web server wakes up and it says, all right, we're going to serve this request. Uh, but what it does is it does server side rendering of those bits. So the server handles all of that load and then passes the rendered HTML back. Um, but then there's also with uh, server side Blazor, there's an, a signal R channel that opens up. So with that WebSocket communication, it's a duplex um, communications layer and any of the deltas. So any of the changes that need to actually occur are basically um, communicated over signal R. And so then you get like this real type feel uh, of the application. So I'm going to actually share uh, my, well, my other screen. I got much, many yeah, screens here. I was about to ask Dave, are, are, are we going to show the site? <laughs> show the site. We're going to look at the site. Hopefully the site's not down, but we do all of our testing in production. Uh, so if you go to .net docs .dev, uh, this is a domain that we purchased, uh, again, very unofficially initially. Uh, and we've got our logo and, uh, and the homepage. And if you scroll through, it's just basically a, a historical listing of all the shows that we've had. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of laid out using Bootstrap because we're amazing CSS developers uh, with an S, you know, we, we focus on design, right? So, uh, and like the simple cards, it's, it, this was inspired by um, the community standup. So if you've ever uh, been to like the ASP.NET community standups uh, and, and kind of saw the way that they laid it out, we very much borrowed and were inspired by what they were doing. And so we use that. And some of the difference, uh, differences is our show, um, we actually have like an upcoming schedule so you can see well into the future. And as part of that, we opened it up to be really community centric and we want to focus on the community and highlight them and give them an opportunity to be a part of the show. And so if you're on uh, .NET docs .dev and you have a, an idea for the show and you want to be a part of it, you can see that you can actually submit a topic and maybe you'll be our guest, right? So we're already booking out into January of 2021. Uh, and we've, we stopped uh, allowing new people to uh, submit topics a while ago uh, because it's been, we were so flooded for, for months. So we just now recently opened it back up. Uh, so if you have an idea and you want to come be on the show and talk.net and share something that you've learned, uh, you know, or, or just kind of maybe even uh, talk about an open source project that you're working on or whatever it may be, we highly encourage that and we're welcoming and we want you to, to do that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it just serves as kind of a, a, a simple, simple site. There's not a lot to it. Um, there's an admin page and there's, you know, different ways to kind of do that. But again, it's all built Blazor server side. So I'm going to minimize this now and go back over here. So uh, let's see here. If I go to web, uh, it's very, very standard um, uh, nomenclature and naming conventions and all that stuff. So we have a startup and in our startup, we get a configuration. So we have configuring of services and this is where dependency injection comes in. It's a first class citizen of .NET core. Um, so we can add uh, various services. And uh, so this is where we add um, server side Blazor. In fact, I didn't even have to add that. That was part of the templating system along with, uh, well, actually, uh, Scott, I believe you did the PR for SignalR. Yeah, maybe we should explain that, David. Um, yep. That's a good call out. So because we're using the server flavor of Blazor, so I, I, you know, I scrolled a banner on the bottom of the screen pointing out that there are two different directions, two different hosting models you can use for Blazor. And uh, Cam's got that banner scrolling again. Because we're using Blazor server, there's a signal R connection that's needed to manage um, the updates for the document object model, the DOM. Um, to scale that in production, 
we're using the Azure Signal R service. And this snippet of code here, so three lines, um, that's all that was needed to wire this project up to sort of use Signal R service in Azure as a proxy or a backplane. Awesome. Yeah, so there's many, many uh, aspects to this that are should just come, you know, second nature to anyone who's been doing .NET um, uh, core development for a while. A lot of the, the naming conventions are um, like an industry standard now. Uh, so you'll see a lot of uh, library authors following those same naming conventions. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is we've encapsulated some of our common logic for wiring up various services inside a service collection uh, extensions class that takes on um, service collection uh, services and configuration. And we wire up some of the different things that are pertinent to our application. So one of them is uh, we're using Cosmos repository. And if you were to look at this, this is actually source code for an open source project that I recently um, made publicly available. Uh, and it's the repository pattern uh, it's a, basically a wrapper around the existing Azure Cosmos DB um, uh, .NET SDK. And this is going way, way back because I remember giving a presentation at the .NET, uh, Wisconsin.NET user group where I first showed off some of these generic repository patterns for what was document DB. And this was like nearly four years ago now. So this has come kind of full circle, right? Where I was showing this little pattern. I was like excited about it. Uh, and uh, do you remember that, Jason? I, I, I don't know if Jason remembers it, but I remember that <laughs> particular meeting. Sorry, yes, I was muted. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. I, I remember every time you come on the show. <laughs> it's always, no, you, it's very interesting. It's not entertaining, but it's, it's very, you engage the, the people there. And so you get a lot of talking versus just, someone sitting and listening to information. So awesome. I Thank you. appreciate your presentation. Yeah, so it was really neat to have that kind of come full circle because um, we, we had written um, that, that pattern a long time ago. And uh, like I mentioned, I was able to actually put together a little um, official dev blog post on Microsoft's site here where the Azure Cosmos DB team kind of pseudo endorsed the unofficial NuGet package. Uh, and it's it's kind of taken off now. So people are interested in it and they're consuming it. And um, I've had some pull requests and I've worked with some of the other community members who are sending things in and, uh, so, you know, basically providing feedback and helping this become, uh, you know, a more popular thing. Uh, but again, this is just one of those, uh, you know, .NET libraries that you can plug in. Uh, much like all the other stuff that you get here from .NET Core. So, you know, configure, this is just another extension method. This comes out of the box though from um, the SDK along with adding Singleton. And this is, you know, so when we look at uh, configuring um, Twitch options, for example. So Twitch options is a strongly typed class that we have here. And it's got a client ID a client secret, and I say two query strings, so that's just a uh, basically a little helper method. But I'm going to go back real quick. So client ID, client secret, and we've got our configuration object. We walk up to a section of that with the name of Twitch options. So using that name of, uh, this is another kind of nicety. I mean, so the sections are named uh, within the configuration. Those names exist as just basically key value pairs. And uh, as a convention, you could use name of, and there's been some debate about this. People prefer to have, uh, some people prefer to have um, uh, just a string literal there. Uh, I prefer to have name of because I will then name all of my sections intuitively against like what I would consider to be a serialized version of that Twitch options, if that makes sense. So that's just a choice that I've made and I've employed that throughout all of the applications I've built. Um, and then we've got some, uh, so basically we, when we configure these options, this exposes um, iOptions interfaces around these, uh, these simple POCO classes. So then we can use those with dependency injection. So any, uh, so we've got like Twitter options. Again, Twitter options is gonna have uh, some, you know, simple uh, properties get and set on a couple different things there. 
uh, and I'm going to look at the Twitter service now. We're registering that as a singleton. Notice how it's actually taking on I options of Twitter options. And from those Twitter options, we'll assign our individual settings. Um, and there's some interesting uh, syntax that's happening here. So a lot of people will ask, well, what's this mean? If you know that's we saw that was a class. So if that's a class, why is it questionable? You know, reference types in C sharp uh, have always had the potential to be null. So now this is one of those newer features where you can express your intent and say uh, or annotate that. Uh, certain reference types are actually intended to potentially be null. So then what that does from a tooling perspective is it actually enables you to uh, express your intent and provide hints to the uh, IDE. So now the IDE can leverage those intentions and uh, basically infer what you were intending to do. And it helps, you know, kind of um, further alleviate uh, flow analysis and things of that nature. So it will start to provide warnings. If we were to walk up to uh, Twitter settings later on uh, inside the class, for example, if I was using it down here and I don't check to see if it's null, the IDE would light up and give me that warning, right? So it's a way to kind of do, uh, basically give you training wheels, so to speak, and have the IDE help you with that. So I'm gonna show two different flavors of this real quick. So when I say that a client ID is just a string, but inside this services class uh, or package rather, I've got nullable context enabled. Um, so when I say it's not questionable, right? If I was to say it was questionable, I would say, you know, it's it could be null, but I'm saying that this could not be null. So what's really weird is I have to actually specify with an initializer that it is null and I have to use what's called the damn it operator. So if I don't say, you know, bang, uh, we're actually gonna get a warning and it's gonna say, well, wait a second, uh, you can't convert null literal to non nullable reference type. So then you have to use that exclamation mark. I'm gonna zoom in real quick. So basically it's saying, since it's just assigned to null, which is already the default value for this reference type anyways, uh, we get a, a CS8625 and it says cannot convert null literal to non nullable reference type. So some of the potential fixes are to uh, declare as nullable, right? So you could make that uh, a questionable type uh, or you could convert to a full property, uh, other things like that. But actually what you can just do is you can say, damn it, it is null, <laughs> I know best and let dependency injection do its thing. Uh, so I see there's a comment here. Someone's just simply stating that they like, uh, oops, I press buttons. Ah, there's more stuff going on the screen, sorry. <laughs> I'll stop pressing things for the screen to show up. Uh, da, 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 da. All, all, all three of us are throwing up banners, apparently. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. We like clicking uh, buttons. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's a little bit of service stuff. Um, let's see, where should I go from here? There's so many different aspects of this. I haven't even shown, um, I mean, we've talked about DI a little bit. We talked about some of the, the common startup stuff. Um, ooh, add lettuce and crypt. Oh. Should, we, should we talk about that, Cam? Yeah, we never did get that working right. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of things on our site that probably don't work right. So uh, yeah, so any uh, it, it, so Let's Encrypt is a free SSL uh, certificate provider. Uh, the the idea is that you know uh, uh, SSL encryption should be freely available to everybody, so they make it really easy to go and provision an SSL certificate. Um, the thing is, because it's free, they put a very short expiration window on it. They put a ninety day expiration window on it. Um, so you have to go and renew your certificate every 90 days. Now you can do that manually, which is actually what we've been doing. Um, but the ideal, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to have your app wired up to just renew its own certificate automatically. Um, and Lettuce Encrypt is a, um, is a package that ostensibly does that, but we've never gotten it to work. 
Yeah, that's very well said. Um, it's been one of those things where we have it like a reoccurring, uh, a recurring um, calendar invite to like, a, you know, sit down as a group and invest the time to make it right. And then every time we do, we're like, uh, yeah, punt, <laughs> move, so move on to the next thing. Maybe a little bit of a backstory here. You may have seen this uh, library in the past called something else. It, it mm -hmm. wasn't previously called Let Us or Let Us Encrypt, like the iceberg or romaine variety. <laughs> um, the story there is, so this library was developed by a former member of the .NET team at Microsoft, uh, Nate McMaster, uh, who now works for uh, AWS, working on .NET stuff over there. Uh, he was threatened with a lawsuit and was forced to change the name to something else. And in the spirit of keeping it, you know, something that's tasty, like lettuce, he used that because it sounds like let's encrypt. Yeah, I love the name. I love the the plan words. It's beautifully done. Uh, so yeah, that's just one of many, many features uh, that we're kind of plugging in and utilizing. So uh, I'm going to call it, go ahead. Well, utilizing being a, a, at least when it comes to lettuce encrypt, utilizing being a, a, uh, aspirational term, <laughs> not in an automated way, right? We're using it. We have certs, but yeah, they're not auto renewing. Um, so maybe here's an idea. If any of our viewers right now would like to be on the show and they know more about certs than we do, which is probably really easy. Um, feel free to submit an idea and we'd love to have you on and work through it on the show. Some of the previous shows we've done were, you know, super humble that way. We just open up our source code and let you do it together like we actually had john skeet on uh and he was i mean it was kind of, it was kind of brutal though he was tearing my stuff apart really good but it's entertaining and that's what we want we want to just be you know uh take down all the barriers and you know here's what we have let's work on it together uh so one of the other things that we've got is this schedule worker so um i'm gonna look at that that's actually a hosted service and this is kind of unique because uh, hosted services have been introduced. This is, they've been around for, I think probably since, and Scott would know more than I do, but probably since like what, 2.1 of, uh, of ASP.NET Core or .NET Core? Uh, that sounds right. Uh, so worker services would have been a thing sooner in .NET Core. The problem was there wasn't an SDK in .NET Core to support them. Um, so they had to create a new SDK specifically for worker services, but in addition to that work, they need to they needed to do some work with the uh, the host builder, the web host. There wasn't previously a generic host uh, or right. host builder that also needed to be created to support this worker service scenario in uh, .NET Core. Two dot one does sound right for when when that was introduced. I'd okay. have to look it up. So you bring up a really interesting point. So one of the things I like to call attention to is the fact that I am just very blatantly against a lot of the templates. Uh, I can't stand some of them and I've tried changing them and influencing and pushing my will, but it's, you know, it's like moving an iceberg. You can't do it. Uh, so every time, uh, this is just like a pet peeve of mine. Every time I do file, you know, new project, I go clean up the uh the templates and one of the things you know you get like the program cs or the startup cs um so i like making my main entry points task-based they actually have a, a run async opposed to run um so you can express that now as a single line which is i think beautiful uh the same thing with um the create host builder they make that public i don't know why they make that public in fact this doesn't even need to be public these could all be so this is an internal class this is a private main entry point uh, it's an executable at the end of the day. So that's all that really matters. It starts up and it works. It's fine. You don't need to have those things exposed in that manner. Same thing with this. This can be just public. It can be a, an expression based body. Um, and you end up with uh, a bunch of usings up here that are unnecessary as well. Don't you, I mean, that's a pet peeve of mine. I don't know. Maybe I just, I'm like a code junkie frustrated. Go ahead. So Dave, I, I have a question. Have you ever put together custom templates to, to just, you know, <laughs> skip the skip the extra step there i i have not i should look into that that's probably what i should do didn't, um, we, didn't we do something with custom templates like a learn module or something scott i don't remember we did not we're actually uh working on updating the docs for that right now um they are um i, I guess incomplete this is 
probably the most positive way I could say that. <laughs> um, however, if you are interested in creating a custom uh, project template or an item template uh, with the .NET Core CLI, uh, in other words, you could say .NET new uh, David Pine 6's web API <laughs> template. <laughs> that is entirely possible. And so where this becomes useful in the real world is you might uh, be working with a team of developers who has uh, a set of naming standards or conventions that need to be followed maybe whenever a new web API project is created. You can encapsulate those standards and naming conventions in your own custom template. And then as of the latest preview release of Visual Studio 2019, you can also make those templates available uh, in Visual Studio, not just from the command line. Well, that's cool. I didn't realize that. I will dig up a link um, to the doc that explains how to create a template, and I'll put that in the chat. Awesome. Hey, hey Dave, uh, you're probably going to talk. That's like uh, what you just did down there is a um, – what's the term? Um Tuple literal. Tuple, thank you. Tuple, it was, it was escaping me. But before you start talking about those tuple literals, uh -huh. um, you know, I just had a thought. Some folks probably might be wondering what's going on with your funky ligatures. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question uh, or a good thing to call attention to. And it's been quiet in terms of questions. Um, so, again, feel free to ask any questions. There's, you know, any questions, fair game. Um, let's make this uh, entertaining. Uh, but, yeah, so I'm using... Uh, Fira code as my um, uh, font inside Visual Studio. And what that does is it basically gives you um, uh, a neat looking uh, font ligatures. So programming ligatures is what they are. So uh, this is just the equal and then greater than sign, but it ends up making it a little bit more beautiful, I think. And, and there's uh, once you start getting into like evaluating uh, comparisons and things like that, it gets pretty neat. I don't know. I prefer it um, like this, like this is not equal, right? Rather than bang equal sign. So those are, those are uh, programming ligatures and that's just from a font. But hey, hey, Dave, just for my own edification, just cause it's so rewarding. Could you actually type bang equals and so, so we can see what happens oh, there? Absolutely. Let me do that. So bang equals Ta -da! sound effect. I added, of course. Uh, so yeah, we were talking about background services or hosted services and, uh, what that does inside the context of an ASP.NET core, uh, web server is it allows you to have an in process service, um, that kind of sits outside the context of your request and response pipeline. Ooh, font name again. It is, uh, Fira, Fira. F I R A C O D. Wait for it. And it is entirely free. Um, there we go. Yeah, Fira code. F I R A C O D E. And that's, you can find it all, just Google search it with Bing. And uh, there you go. Um, so yeah, the, this sits outside the context of the request response pipeline. So it's basically a way to provide in process uh, communication between things that might be relevant um, later on that you might want to use within the uh, a request and response. So uh, for example, our schedule service here, as you can imagine, uh, is pulling our schedule of shows, you know, past, present, and future. And the shows don't change very often. In fact, uh, it's very, very seldom, maybe once a day, you know, if we're updating something or uh, maybe as few as uh, once a week, you know, because we'll update a show after it's been live and we'll add images to it and stuff like that. So it's very, very infrequently that it's changing. So now what we can do is with a background service using iMemory cache and our service, is we can uh, basically have this background service that will occasionally go uh, push things into a cache. So then uh, the, the website becomes very, very responsive. Like, you know, the first hit's pretty, uh, well, not even the first hit because typically once it first fires up, this execution happens instantaneously. So as it's firing up, um, you know, the, basically, uh, the cache is being hydrated with all of the stuff and, uh, you know, the first request that comes through to actually populate data, 
is usually fully hydrated with everything that it needs. And it's pretty, pretty snappy. And this happens in the background. So it just updates as needed. So I actually have some questions about this, Dave, because I didn't even know this was in there. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, uh, can you scroll up just a little bit uh, so mm -hmm. to, the, to the declaration again? Yeah. Uh, up, up here at the top. Uh, yeah. So this is a background, a background service. So tell yeah. me, tell me more about the background service. Like what's the, what's the execution scope on this? When does this run? This runs uh, at startup. So when the app starts, it calls into execute async and there's a cancellation token that the ASP.NET Core um, instance will, will pass to you. And that cancellation token can be used to determine when the app is actually shutting down. So what you do typically, the pattern is that you'll sit in a while loop while not being canceled, do your thing. So okay, cool. So right here, we'll basically seed the cache, uh, which is getting all of the shows for a certain time, walking up to the cache and seeding those. Uh, and, you know, we'll basically just delay in our finally uh, for the full cycle delay and whatever that may be. And if um, uh, if the app cancels, then this just basically ends. So it's, but it just sits there in a loop and it will just go, you know, occasionally update as needed and uh, however long we've configured it and pull data. And we have a way to actually break the cache too. Since it's a, this cache instance, um, the memory cache uh, is a way to basically um, persist things in memory in the context of our, our um, ASP.NET Core app. We can uh, walk up to that same key and push things into it, and it will just update for everybody, right? David, while you're here, um, something else folks might wonder about is looking at your constructor there, you have what appears to be tuples yeah. that are being used with an expression bodied member. Yeah. So that's so. This is an interesting concept. Um, I uh, I've been a big fan of tuples now. Uh, when I first saw them, I was initially terrified. Like the language uh, has been evolving very very rapidly, and it's been hard to keep up with. Um, but I think it's a good thing. It's a, it's evolving in the right direction, and it's truly influenced by some of the best language features that are you know modern developers are seeking around the globe. So. Uh, tuples uh, is is not really anything new. It's new to C Sharp. Um, so one of the things that you can do, and this isn't optional, this is one of those preference things, but you'll notice that when I first came in here, we had multiple lines where we were uh, assigning uh, from the constructor's parameters to two different fields. Uh, and it ends up being, right, if you have your um, curly braces, you've got four lines of code. So it depends on how you and your team want to preference um, those types of decisions about style. Uh, I think this is more or less a stylistic approach when you do tuples uh, being deconstructed into the assignment of a tuple literal from a constructor, which is a mouthful to say, but really that's what's happening. So we have this expression bodied member. This is our uh, you know, public constructor for our service worker. Uh, we're asking for DI to provide us um, uh, our I memory cache and our I schedule service. We're expressing this constructor as uh, the deconstruction of a tuple literal, which is a cache and service, a schedule service. And that's assigning to our cache and schedule uh, service fields. So this is literally a single, single line constructor that's taking and assigning multiple things. And it's a it's a very terse way to you know, express something that would otherwise potentially be verbose. Um, so it, it's up to you if you wanna do that, uh, you're, you and your team, it's, you know, there's other uh, more valid use cases for tuples and stuff like that. Uh, some of the biggest arguments against it are, you know, what if you start having, um, since, you know, I schedule service is actually a reference type, what if, we want to call ask over to saying, well, if that's null, then we would throw uh, a new argument null exception, right? And that's one of those things where it's like, well, that's a debate you have to have with your team. Is this acceptable? Does this look worse? Uh, it's uh, functionally equivalent in that um, this will work, but then you end up with more complexity. And part of the problem is, um, you know, do you really want to have 
a line that gets longer and longer. And then if you end up doing new lines, you know, how does it look? And again, it's all that that's all stylistic. It's just a matter of opinion with some of that stuff. Um, for me personally, I prefer uh, knowing that if, if something's coming from DI and we can verify, like if I'm the owner of these two things and I know that I've registered them and that DI is going to give them to me um, and I'm not going to do any like, you know, uh, failing fast and, you know, checking for null and throwing a, a argument null exception, I'm fine with doing this sort of thing. The only problem that I have is the amount of time it takes for me to type that. I wish there was tooling and, uh, you know, some of the Roslyn hints about simplifying those things. But again, that's, uh, that's a matter of opinion. So I'm going to see if I can find uh, some cooler C sharp stuff. Cause there's some, let me see if I can find like a switch expression. Cause those are cool to show off. Is there any questions while I'm digging through some of the stuff here? Um, one thing we should uh, note as you're walking through mm -hmm. this, David, is is what uh, which language features require which version of C sharp. So switch expressions, for example, you'd want to call out. You know which version of C sharp is required. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Um, so a lot of the language features. Um, are actually tied to uh, different uh, runtime implementations now. So, for example, if you want to use C Sharp 9, uh, which I'm not demonstrating here, but C Sharp 9 is introducing some of the language features for like records and stuff like that, uh, that requires .NET 5. Uh, the same is true with um, C Sharp um, 8. So you need um, .NET Core 3.1. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's certain things, you know, where you have to very, you know, be mindful of that. And the docs actually, Bill Wagner on our team, he does an amazing job at ensuring that that's very well communicated when you're looking at various features into the docs uh, platform, you know, what the minimal, um, uh, you know, runtime is that you have to be working against. So I've got another one here. Uh, and this one's another C sharp feature that I've, I've, uh, long considered to be, uh, almost scary, if you will. You have to put a lot of faith into the runtime to determine the scope of a using statement. So uh, having implementations of iDisposable means that you as a developer, you're essentially responsible for the lifetime of that object. And you want to ensure that you're using it responsibly. So you would want to put this ideally in a try finally where you call dispose uh, in the finally, or you can use the syntactual uh, so sugar of a using statement, which will do that under the covers for you when it compiles it down. Uh, so we can say using var content uh, equals new form URL encoded content from this uh, dictionary. And notice how our using statement uh, just basically declares this here. The using comes before the declaration of the type. So if I wanted to get explicit with the type, I could say um, using form URL encoded content uh, I don't know why it's questionable. It's not questionable because we're assigning to it right there. It's definitely assigned. Um, but you know, you could, uh, the old way to do this would be you would wrap that inside this scope. So then wherever you're using that content, um, you'd, you'd essentially have it scoped out such like that. So this would go inside there. Uh, but one of the things that's changed is now the scoping is actually implicit. So if I undo this, and I get rid of that, you know, those those braces, um, it's implicitly scoped. So when content is no longer being used, either here or here or here, uh, you know, between these invocations, it'll implicitly be disposed. So once this method is done being called, it's for sure going to be disposed and cleaned up. So it's, it's one of those things where you can scope it explicitly or you can let the runtime kind of determine that now. Uh, and that's one of the newer features, which is kind of neat. Another thing I like to call attention to is the fact that dictionaries have, uh, this has been around for a while though. This is like back to like C sharp, probably six, where they introduced indexers uh, into uh, the object initializers. So when I say new dictionary of string and string, uh, and we initialize that object like this, we can actually say, well, index, client underscore ID is equal to the client ID. Um, alternatively, you'd have to have like uh, almost like an anonymous um, object that would represent the key value pair there instead. So just little things like that, that end up kind of making the language uh, almost more appealing. Um, um, David, I'm not sure if you covered this already or not. I've been 
catching up on warrior none over here while you're talking. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> JSON converts that deserialize object. Um, mm -hmm. We could talk a little bit about system.text.json and mm -hmm. how um, that's a new, new ish thing in .NET Core. Yeah. What is, uh, what is system uh, text uh, Jason Jason for 300 um, <laughs> so that's uh, so Newton soft um, dot Jason Jason dot net this is from our, our friend uh, James Newton King uh, this has been around and this is actually the most popular dot uh, net package in NuGet uh, the, well NuGet's only dot net packages but the most popular NuGet package in the world uh, it's got the most downloads. And uh, so I think that's probably one of the reasons why Microsoft's like, we should hire him. And they did. And uh, so he's been working with um, a bunch of the, the you know, the runtime team. And they came up with what is called system.tax.json. And it's uh, kind of a, a system proper way to take the amazing work that's been done there uh, and kind of bring it full circle into uh, the environment as a first class citizen. So there, there will be a day where you won't have to use uh, this extra package. It'll just be part of the framework. So I think, um, I think it's already here. So I could just say system dot text Jason. No, it's not there. Why don't I have it? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so it's uh, it's an alternative. Uh, you can use it. Um, I, I think I have other projects that are actually using it. Um, did that come with 3.1, do you know, Scott? Sounds right. So uh, the deciding factor here, I guess, you know, the questions to ask yourself um, as to whether you would use newtonsoft.json or system text JSON, it really comes down to, you know, is this an existing application? If so, you might be better off just hanging out on newtonsoft.json. Um, the reason is um, system text JSON is really providing a subset of the features that are available um, over in uh, Newtonsoft JSON. And that's intentional. Uh, Microsoft does not want to take out that open source project. Um, it has a very, uh, you know, vibrant community built up around it. Um, instead, what Microsoft wants to do here is provide a developer, you know, essentially everything they would need to get a new project off the ground. You start off with system.text.json as sort of your training wheels for JSON serialization needs. And if you grow beyond the capabilities that are provided by that namespace, you would then consider newtonsoft.json. Yeah, our, our good friend Dave Brock uh, is saying that he uses this table when making the decision of which one to use. Uh, and this, I think this is a, a guide that our, uh, our good friend, Tom Dykstra put together. If I, if I recall correctly, uh, but another thing, uh, I don't know if this calls attention to that or not, but one of the things to also consider is that they're doing significant performance improvements around, um, the system.tax.json, um, implementation. So under the covers, they're utilizing span. Uh, they're they're starting to introduce, uh, and they already have actually introduced asynchronous APIs. So if that's something that's important, you know, if you've got bigger, you know, workloads where that's relevant. For example, we talked about Cosmos DB before. Uh, one of the things that Cosmos DB does is it uh, basically persists uh, simple documents. Think of it like that way. Um, but I had heard someone mentioned that they have documents that are as large as 50 megabytes. So imagine trying to, you know, serialize and deserialize that over the wire. Uh, what would that look like if you were to just have this giant blob in memory? And then once it's actually in memory, you call deserialize object from this giant string. What happens, right? So there's no, you know, like buffering. There's no uh, asynchronous state machines. There's no optimizations around how, what's being allocated and stuff like that. So it's, it's, uh, it's only going to get better. So I just realized that we spent a lot of time kind of talking about different services, some of the language features. We've talked about um, DI and things like that, but we haven't even looked at any of the like peripheral packages. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to really call attention to is uh, some of the actual markup, right? Some of the Razor engine bits and what does that look like? Uh, so let's open up just the 
index real quick. Um, so if you're familiar with MVC uh, or Razor Pages, um, Blazor uh, server side actually also has, um, is utilizing the Razor engine. So you write, um, you know, this is like the evolution of uh, CSHTML. So it's uh, Razor. So you end up having HTML mixed in with declarative little bits of C Sharp. So we can say we've got this at page directive. And so this is our index. So we can say just forward slash as a string verbatim. Uh, so at the root of our uh, web domain, this is what we're gonna serve up. It's gonna be our, our index. We've got an attribute here that says allow anonymous. And this is a you know, full on C sharp uh, attribute. So this is inside your markup, so to speak, right? And then we've got, you know, expressional templating where we can say, or conditional templating rather, where we can have um, if expressions and we have full on C sharp objects. So if I hover in here, you'll see that says I enumerable of docs show. Uh, and this is a shows uh, variable. And if uh, we don't have any shows uh, or if shows are null, we're gonna show a loading indicator. And I'm gonna show you this real quick because this is kind of fun to, to show off. So if we go back to docs.dev forward slash loading, you can go there right now. This is kind of like an Easter egg. Uh, to test out our loading page, I put a route on there that shows our, our loading markup so that I could test it, <laughs> right? So we've got this component now, we've got a route that sits behind this component for loading. Uh, and it just shows our little um, excited.net bot taking off, right? And uh, buckle up, we're taking off. So, uh, hey, 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 Dave, are you using Zoomit? I did, yeah. Hey, 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 can you go back to over to that? Probably, maybe. Yeah, check this out. Hey, go to go go to the loading screen. Loading. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, instead of zooming in with Control One, zoom in yeah. with Control Four. Control Four. Oh, oh, see, I just got zoom it today because I thought I was going to do this. So, you know, the more, you know, live zoom it. Sweet. <laughs> I would have forgotten that. But thank you. How do you exit now? Uh, hit control four again. Oh, okay. So it's just like a toggle. <laughs> uh, that This was supposed to be the part where he tells you. you can't exit. <laughs> I have to reboot my machine. We're not in Vim. Come on. <laughs> It would have been a, a nice explanation for right. why the jetpack. Uh, so we've got a loading indicator component, and I'm going to go over there and show that. You know, uh, you'll notice that um, uh, syntax hiding, highlighting makes that purple and bold, and because it's actually a recognized component. So if we hold Control and click, that doesn't work. It's supposed to work. Come on, loading. Well, anyways, here's my loading. Um, no, that's the route. I promise I'll find it. Loading indicator, ta-da, right? So it's simply um, some markup with a grid and a grid of clouds. And I have a to-do here because I'm a lazy developer. Uh, I was going to add like Azure clouds and, you know, stagger them and have opacity and stuff like that. And then that's what the, the jet pack was flying into. Uh, but I never got that far. That was just, that was my ambitions to do that. Uh, but we've got our grid logo and hey, preparing to for blast off. That's the class. So, so uh, that's that CSS class. That's what makes it, you know, mm -hmm. vibrate as he's, you know, taking off. Yep, yep, exactly. So that's just the class that sits over this SVG, and there's just a a, a .NET bot Jetpack SVG that sits there, and it just da -da 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 -da. and then you can change the message, right? So we can use this loading indicator anywhere we want, whenever we know that there's going to be some sort of latency. And we can pass uh, a message to it. And this loading indicator is what, you know, it's basically a parameter. So one of the differences I'd like to call attention to here is that we have this at code directive. That means everything within this, uh, these brackets, these little yellow kind of highlighted bits are just pure C sharp. So there's no, uh, you know, kind of context switching between markup and C sharp. So everything in here is just purely C sharp. And we've got this parameter uh, attribute that decorates this public get set property as being exposed to any of the consumers who are using it. So if I do control minus a couple times, oops, control plus. Um, well, let me kind of take a step back from what David's talking about here. So he, he mentioned this code directive um, that exists in a, a Razor or Blazor component. 
one of the most common questions I hear is, well, what if I don't want to embed my code in, in the Razor file? Um, it actually is possible to create a, uh, I hesitate to call it a code behind because that brings nightmares from the web forms world. <laughs> but uh, Is post back, right? <laughs> no, yeah, there's no is post back here. <laughs> what I'm getting at is uh, if you, uh, do want to move that code out of the code directive in the razor file and into its own C sharp class? That is possible, and it it is supported. Absolutely, and that's a, a great segue into showing that the the loading indicator is more of a pure uh, just razor um, kind of page, and the index is uh, what Scott was alluding to. So I've got an index .razor and an index. Um, uh, razor.cs and that razor.cs you notice how visual studio actually uh, actually intelligently collapses those two because it looks at those and says oh these are basically to the same type of component um, so i have uh, my air quotes uh, code behind sitting behind a partial class so whenever you create a razor component right the index.razor um, the razor uh, build engine will actually look at that and create an index.cs file, an index class on your behalf. And that's hidden here. You don't actually see that. Uh, so when you want to have this type of setup, you actually have to say public partial class. I'm going to say that one more time, public partial class. If you don't have partial, you're going to get conflicting or ambiguous names because it's like, well, we already have uh, an index here. And the the Razor team was smart enough to know that when, when they're generating this code, they actually make theirs partial so that you can do this. So you can have a public partial index class. And those two things are now a cohesive unit. And you can do things like, um, you know, we've talked about dependency injection. And with dependency injection, uh, you know, one of the standards is to have uh, dependencies injection, uh, injected into the constructor. Uh, but they actually have an inject attribute that allows you to now inject uh, properties. So we can say inject uh, this cache. And if you remember from our service, the background service, uh, this is the cache that uh, we were going to hydrate when the app starts up. So now when the app starts up, we have all of our data already. So we can just walk up to this cache and pull the information out that we need. Um, we have other things that we kind of rely on. This one's an IJS uh, runtime. And this is this is where Blazor gets uh, really neat in that they have interop betwixt uh, your, your Razor, you know, server-side rendered bits um, and the stuff that's coming over, you know, the deltas that are being exchanged for the DOM updates on the client, uh, that can actually communicate with JavaScript. So you can do from C sharp, you can call into this JavaScript runtime and you can interop, make calls into JavaScript and vice versa. You can actually say from JavaScript, you want to call back into C sharp. And that's kind of like, what? That is insane. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to show you real quick is in our loading app, because it's still loading apparently. Now if we just go home, uh, let's say we want to submit an idea. And we, when we go to submit an idea, uh, you'll notice that we have this uh, CAPTCHA, right? ReCAPTCHA. And this is actually a Google utility. And there's some uh, JavaScript that has to happen and there's all this little stuff. So if I'm to say that I'm not a robot, uh, you'd click on that and then Google's JavaScript that's actually running in your browser at that point in time would verify whether or not it thinks you're a robot. And so I didn't have to write any of that JavaScript, but what I did have to do is write a little bit of a wrapper around that. Um, so I'm gonna toggle back out this way. Uh, so if you're to fill out this form and you click, I'm um, not a robot, then the button, if it actually thinks that you're not a robot, then the button to send this will actually be enabled. Um, so I'm just gonna type in an idea, say my first name is this, my last name is that. Uh, we're gonna do David Pine six because I like making fun of myself. And I'm gonna say I'm not a robot. And then hopefully Google's like, oh, you're not a robot. Um, and then I could send it if I wanted to, but I'm not going, well, should I? I'll do it, let's do it. Send. And now I'm gonna get an email. Uh, because we're actually using logic apps in the back end. So, and Cam, uh, Cam, you're the one that introduced me to logic apps. Uh, 
I, I, I am, and you're paying me back by sending me spam. <laughs> so you got an email just now, right? Uh, maybe. I don't think it's here yet, but, <laughs> but it should be on its way, yeah. It should be on its own, yeah. Uh, so we're using Logic Apps, and Logic Apps was very, very simple. This was the first uh, application I've used, um, well, I was able to use them with. I've never used them before, uh, and it was really, really simple. So you go into the portal, you create a new s resource, and you select Logic App. Uh, and then from there, you just basically specify like a little workflow, like, okay, you want to receive an HTTP request. And then after that, what do you want to do? And it's like, well, I want to send an email. So then you say, okay, send an email. There's actually a little node for Outlook. And then you specify, well, here's what the request schema is going to look like. And um, from that, I'm going to jam that into an email. And then you can actually have a, an HTTP response. And, well, and go ahead. Let's go ahead and show, can we show off the Logic app? Because yeah, because I mean the the logic apps were so there's so many little things that I used to like write little you know REST API endpoints for and prop them up in an Azure web app and like the whole point of of Azure logic apps is not having to do that right it's coding yeah. by drag and drop it feels to me it feels like so I used to do hour of code lessons at like my kids schools and everything and to me it really feels like that that language that they use for the hour of code demonstrations the you know Scratch from from MIT yeah. the, the kids programming language. It reminds me of that. Yeah, and it was really neat because for me, um, you know, being a C-sharp developer for probably, you know, 10 plus years, I had always thought to myself, uh, okay, we need to send an email. So we need to use the SMTP client, right? And you, if you're a C-sharp developer, you're probably familiar with that client uh, class. And then you'd have to go send an email and you remember all the boilerplate code and stuff like that. So uh, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this, but basically, yeah. So when, um, when an HTTP request is received, uh, this is basically our post URL. So this is where we'll post to. And, and, and all, and let me just jump in here real quick. Mm -hmm. All the auth is built into that post URL. There's an, there's an OAuth token in the query string. We're not going to show that OAuth token because then you'd be sending emails as Dave and we don't want to do that. <laughs> but, but, but all the auth is taken care of at that level. And it's actually f perfectly fine for our logic apps um, to have this uh, URL and use it because that's happening on the server side. And that's an important thing when you're talking about the different hosting models for Blazor. If this service was being consumed in your client Blazor WebAssembly application, the clients could see that URL and then they would have your token. Right. So that's a clear thing to really think about. So Dave Rock says, can you do any code in Logic Apps? Um, what if you decide halfway you want to write a quick snippet or something? That's a good question. I yeah. Don't, I, I, I don't know the answer to that one. I, I do know what I have done. So like Logic Apps lives in the same kind of family as like Microsoft Flow. Yep. And Zapier and if this and that and all these services that exist just as basically um, HTTP endpoints out there that do stuff for you, right? That you can go mm -hmm. and just send them a webhook and then do stuff. Um, what I, I don't know specifically if we can add code to a logic app. I haven't seen it. Wouldn't be surprised if we if we go to click new step, if there's something in there, maybe um, I don't know. Let's let is there a there's there's actually a code view. Um tab up at the top. That's, that's just the uh, JSON that represents uh, this this stuff. That's not really the code code. Okay. But so is, is there like a code? If, I'm just typing why, why, why are you searching for Dave Brock? He's not going to be in lots of caps. <laughs> Come on. Inline code. Oh, my God. Look at that. Come on. Well, look at that. So the one thing that I have done um, – so what I was leading up to there is one thing that I've done when I need to do something that isn't in one of these services, but is in another, they all have, so like, let's say I'm in if this, then that, if this, then that just added multi-step flows. But up until recently, they were just one step. If this happens, then do that. That was all they were. So a lot of times they would have support for if this happens, where this is, you know, some service that Logic Apps doesn't have signed up, like um, a lot of my home automation stuff, for example, like like Ring uh, doorbells. Um, if my Ring doorbell rings, what do I want to do? Do I want to do something in my home automation system? But my home automation system is all custom. It's not in if this then that. Well, what you can do is you can use a service like if this then that to be the front end of that flow and have it kick off something in logic apps using you know just a standard http request like a webhook or something 
Um, or you can have logic apps get to a certain point and then kick off again, a webhook to like if this and that or something else that then shifts context over there and then maybe comes back to a different logic app later or uh, stuff like that. So you can kind of piece them together and, and build these kind of intricate uh, logic app flows without writing any code. Absolutely. Yeah, if you want a deeper dive, um, last Saturday we had a talk uh, with about specifically logic apps, uh, logic apps and triggers with Chester Harden. I'll put a link into the to the chat regarding the YouTube recording of that show was way more in depth than what uh, David's going to be doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, yeah, so that, those are logic apps. They're pretty slick. Uh, again, I've learned a lot about them and I thought they were very, very simple. So one of the neat things I just wanted to call attention to is that post URL that has the token kind of encoded in the URL itself. Uh, we just persist that with uh, Azure Key Vault. So our configuration just flows through and, uh, you know, we add things to Key Vault and, you know, when Cam or Scott or whoever else has um, the ability to interact with the, the, the source code here, they can, they can just run the app and it just works, right? And everything's kind of protected and it's really nice. So that's, uh, that's that. And we should have received an email. Um, but I just wanted to call attention to that uh, recaptcha, if you recall, that's what we were looking at. So the recaptcha, we actually have as a component. Um, and let me fix this. So we have got this little kind of um, blazer component library that sits by itself. And uh, we've got, let me see here, da, 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 da. where's the import? So that's the imports. And then we've got the component JS. And then we've got the recaptcha uh, component itself. And it's a very, very complex uh, markup, right? So you see we have a div and an ID. And that's it. Uh, uh, and then we've got some code behind and there's more stuff here. This is where more of the fun stuff comes in, but we've say public sealed partial class. Uh, we're taking on JavaScript again as a runtime dependency. We have our recaptcha options and these options are basically again, using all of the common nomenclature from uh, dependency injection and the options pattern. And we've got a site key and a secret key. And these two things are actually uh, absolutely critical. Uh, they, they all come from your Google account. And then you'll wire them up, uh, you know, through configuration. So when you add uh, Blazor recaptcha, it's going to wire up an HTTP client dependency, and it's going to configure against the recaptcha options. Um, and then that just flows through your system. But uh, so then we'll have those options available to us, and then we ask for a client factory, and then we have a couple of little interesting parameters. One of them is an event callback. An event callback is actually, it's a read-only struct uh, that represents uh, a callback to an event. So this is um, not really going back to like .NET, you know, when it first came out with events, but uh, a more modern approach to that with components. So we can have consumers of this, since it's a parameter, they can assign to the evaluated uh, parameter and they'll get called uh, as the event occurs. So once once the uh, the me clicking on the recaptcha occurs, we're going to call this evaluated, and you'll see kind of what that looks like. So on the first render, we have to load some JavaScript stuff, and this is probably the most JavaScript we wrote for the entire app, and it's over here in the components. So we call this load function. Uh, we dynamically inject a script tag. Um, and this, in all honesty, all of this was completely borrowed from uh, another developer uh, who has an open source project. Um, I need to find it so I can give them proper credit for all of this. Uh, I made modifications to it and kind of made it my own, uh, but the the nuts and bolts of it were was entirely theirs and I don't claim this as my own. Um, but basically, yeah, we, we load it up, we inject the thing, we wait for recaptcha, uh, and then we set a timeout, and it waits a little bit, and then it resolves. Um, but then we, uh, when we do our rendering, uh, there's basically you know a site key and a callback, and this is where we actually have a .NET object. So this is kind of the both you know both ends of JavaScript calling into C Sharp and C Sharp calling into JavaScript. So if we go back and look at our component in here, that's the render. So 
uh, render. So once we load it, that makes the, the JavaScript dynamically be injected. So there's a, a script tag and then JavaScript is then running in the client for uh, the recapture bits. And then we say render, and we're gonna actually pass this. And that second parameter is very important because this is actually the component instance that we're passing into it. So we're passing in a reference to ourself in the JavaScript. And when we look at what that does, we have an object over here that represents that. We just say .NET OBJ, because we're good at naming things, right? And we rely on that ID that, you know, we saw the markup for the div, and we say recaptcha or Google recaptcha.render. And this is the JavaScript part where we specify our callback, and our callback is actually going to use that reference to our C Sharp object. And we're going to say invoke method async. And we're going to pass it this string verbatim. And this is where, you know, magic strings like that kind of become tedious and it's not really best practices and it's undesirable and, you know, whatever. But that's what we're going to call and we're going to give it the response. And if it expires, we're going to say on expired. So those two method names are very important. So let me let me double check my understanding here because mm -hmm. um, you showed me this before and I thought it was really cool. So what's going on is the 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 user is interacting with the recaptcha on the page right mm -hmm. and their interaction with that recaptcha is getting sent back up through the signal r channel to the blazer side the blazer server side component which is then doing the the back end you know uh whatever communication has to happen with recaptcha is that correct sort of Sort of, yeah. So th there's a lot of things going on. I should really do like a little diagram here because I lose myself in it too. So, <laughs> so when, the, when the component first loads, it calls load and load will actually call down the JavaScript to kind of, um, you know, make sure that the, all of the Google JavaScript bits are there given your site key. And then in doing so, uh, we say render. And when we render, we pass in uh, an uh, our own component, the recapture component into the JavaScript. So JavaScript now has a, has a hold of our Razor component, like a reference to it to call actions on it. And then it basically says Google recapture um, and it sets up the callbacks. So now it's sitting there idle doing its thing because JavaScript's running and it's doing the evaluation of determining whether or not you're a robot. So you're doing, you're entering your fields, you're doing all this stuff, you're filling out the form. Then you hit check yep check it now evaluate me and then that's when this actually gets fired so uh, all of the java uh, javascript client side stuff looks at it does its thing and it says now we're going to call out to uh on evaluated and we get the recapture response and that response payload uh this is where our, our our secret key comes into play uh these two things are then passed to google's recapture api so, so this is the part. This is the part where, like, this is happening server side in Blazor, right? Yep. So now the client's calling back into the server. It's calling onto that component, and then this component here, on evaluated, is then saying we're going to do an HTTP call and pass off this payload to Google to validate whether or not it thinks that you're a robot or not. And then from there, it deserializes the response and then calls into evaluated. And evaluated is again that parameter that event that fires and consumers of this can then, you know, have a listener. So they'll get notified when that occurs and then take an action. So what I'm doing on the form is once it's been evaluated and if it is valid, then I'm enabling the button to say we can send it. Cool. And, and, and so as, so the big benefit to doing this, this way rather than you know like if you go to recaption you download like their javascript sdk and you embed all kinds of javascript stuff in our in your pages um the advantage of doing this is that it's it's just a blazer component that we just drop in right yeah so the thing is this could be shared now so what you can do is any blazer app if this was imagine this being like a NuGet package you could take on a dependency of this you could say i want to add blazer recaptcha you pass in your configuration with those well-known keys those two the site key and the secret key and then you just wire up to an event because you can consume that component and then away you go it's as simple cool. as that so yeah making the, that that just basically highlights the capabilities of like the componentry aspect for building out blazer components um, and it is rather complex, right? There's a lot of steps there. There's a lot of different things that can go wrong, um, but it's, uh, I think it's pretty neat. 
Um, so I think, I don't know how much more time we've got. We could look at more things. Um, it's been kind of quiet here in chat. So I'm curious if there's any questions at this point in time, if there's anything that we went over too quickly, or if there's any, uh, you know, anyone wants to say, shut up and stop talking, whatever. Yeah. Um, I do. <laughs> no, I have a question. I'm not going to say. Shut your, shut I your will. Mouth. Shut um, up, Dave. Oh. I, I wanted to point out, so this JavaScript interop, mm -hmm mechanism that David's been talking about. Um, this is your ticket to integrating Blazor with an existing single page app written in an inferior language like JavaScript. Um, so, so say for example, you have a React single page app or an Angular single page app, right? Those are all over the place um, in the enterprise. And you decide, okay, we would like to start from this point forward um, building all new pages or all new components with C Sharp and use Blazor. You can do that. And again, it's this JavaScript interop capability that is going to enable you to do that. Um, right. So I guess the takeaway there is, despite what you may have heard, uh, Blazor is not intended to kill JavaScript. Um, the two can happily coexist in the same application. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. It's, you know, there, there's a marriage there that's happening and, uh, uh, you know, you can't have um, the, the C sharp in the browser without JavaScript. It's just a matter of fact right now. And uh, Ed Charbonneau and I like to go back and forth. You may have seen some of these things on Twitter, but uh, I like to call attention to the fact that there is still JavaScript and uh, it's not going anywhere. And uh, he has some really compelling stories though about, writing huge, huge applications and only needing, you know, like 10 or so lines of JavaScript throughout the entire thing. So I see we've got a question here. <clears throat> I don't know what you mean by... Oh, hey, my Siri. phone's talking to me. Siri's talking to me. Uh, so Dave Rock says, weird question. Um, I know that you're a C-sharp geek. Have you seen any nice C-sharp 9 updates and thought, ooh... We could use that on our site. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like <laughs> all this, all the scene, uh, C sharp nine features, um, uh, with the exception of like probably functional pointers and some of the things that are, you know, like based around like uh, lower level, uh, stuff like that. Um, there's a, uh, Oh, Dave, like, you should show people, uh, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the, Oh gosh, I can't remember sharp it. Lab. Thank you. Sharp lab. Sharp lab. This is totally not even part of, our, uh, our our site though this is this is other I mean things. of course it's not but but I mean people are interested in knowing what tools and things we use right yeah yeah so that's a good point so I learned about sharp lab io I'm gonna zoom in on this real quick sharp lab io um, so https uh, colon forward slash forward slash sharp lab s h a r p l a b dot io I learned about this a while ago uh, from Jared Parsons. He shared it with me before I worked at Microsoft actually. Uh, and what it does is it basically allows you to write C Sharp in the browser, but not like Blazor, right? This basically serves as like a, a REPL, so to speak. So you can actually choose uh, if you want to decompile things, uh, you know, decompile down to C Sharp or IL or the JIT um, ASM. You can look at the syntax tree. I'll just click on some of these different things here real quick, IL. So you can see what this program would look like in IL, uh, all the different lower level instructions and things like that, or even more crazy stuff. Um, you can look at the syntax tree and kind of open it up and see these are actually um, the types from Roslyn itself. So you can see how these things are kind of declared. And this is basically the um, parts of like, the internals of the compiler, the Roslyn C Sharp compiler. And it's really, really compelling to look at some of these cool things and kind of learn about them. Uh, but actually using this visualizer for the, the syntax tree, I've learned about Roslyn and how to interact with it a little bit more. Uh, so there's ways to verify things, you know, you can, oh yeah, verified, it's great. Uh, an explanation, so you can see, oh, this uh, basically talks, you know, this is really, really simple. There's more complex ones, or you can actually run it. So we can just run, um, and have an application that's running here and, uh, you know, I, uh, Wisconsin.net user group, and then ta-da, it's over here, right? There's the output. So, uh, but the nice thing is what they have done here, the creators of this, is they've given you a way to actually choose 
the Roslyn branches. And this is what's really, really neat is you can actually choose like feature release branches. So before C sharp nine uh, was being, you know, more officialized, uh, you can actually go in here and click on some of these different ones like records and you can see their working branch inside the browser and test it out and see what records were all about or uh, top level uh, functions and things like that. Uh, so this is actually using master uh, from October 11th. So this is really, really blazing new stuff. So we actually have top level uh, stuff already. So since there's just a using, we can say, uh, let's just do, let's get real fancy and say using static, whoops, uh, council. And then you get statement completion, like a modern IDE, but this is in the browser, which is kind of cool. So we can just say right line, right? And this is our application. Just like that. And it's like, this is amazing. C sharp keep statement validated. <laughs> uh, so then, yeah, the records is probably one of the things that I was uh, most excited about. Um, so you can say public uh, record and everyone does the person demo. So we can just do a person. So we can, I got a bubble in my throat here. String um, first name, uh, string last name. And then you actually have, oh, that's right. This is broken. Uh, you can't do records in here, unfortunately. And one of the reasons you can't is because uh, they have this is external init attribute from the compiler services. And that's actually part of .NET 5. And even though they're pulling the latest bits from the Roslyn compiler, their, uh, their stuff here is not actually built from .NET 5. So they can't use that. That's part of uh, the, some of the framework dependencies. But again, sharplab.io, check it out. You can do some really cool things in there. And uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully you like that. Um, we've got uh, one of our friends here from Twitch saying, we've seen people compare Blazor to Silverlight without actually digging into it. <laughs> uh, so one thing I will say, is um, if if we do want to compare the two, the first thing that you have to look at is whether or not we're talking about the hosting model of server side uh, or WebAssembly. I'm assuming they mean WebAssembly. Um, if not, feel free to correct me there. Uh, but if they are, uh, one thing that's really interesting about WebAssembly is it actually lives inside the same security sandbox as JavaScript. So it's as safe or as dangerous as what JavaScript was. Whereas Silverlight actually relied on what was, uh, you know, uh, one of the limitations was it was plugin based. So the security sandbox did not exist and it opened a huge amount of security problems. So that's one of the huge discrepancies between the two. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I've never actually used Silverlight. So I'd be curious if anyone else has or anyone else has any other insights. The, the one thing I would say, that here's the big difference between uh, Silverlight and uh, Blazor WebAssembly. It's that, you know, WebAssembly is based on a web standard. Um, it's not a proprietary format. Um, whereas, if you, you know, if you look at Silverlight, as David mentioned, that was requiring you to install a plugin on any device on which you wanted to use that. That's not the case with Blazor WebAssembly. So again, with Blazor WebAssembly, we're, we're uh, relying on a standard, a web standard. Whereas in Silverlight, we were relying on proprietary technology, therefore requiring the download and installation of a plugin. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think, I think we're getting close to calling this a success. I don't know if there's anything else that I could show off. <laughs> So, so you were looking at, you're looking at the Twitter service right there. We could at least, we, we should tell our Twitter story. Oh yeah. There's a Twitter story. <sighs> there is a Twitter story. So I, I, I just like, I just like making you tell it though. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I recognize as much. So, uh, we, <laughs> when we, when we created the show, we wanted to become official. So we're like, we're going to build a website and we're going to have all these amazing things and we're going to create a, a social media presence. So we decided to create uh, a Twitter account. So uh, let's just go to our Twitter account because I think we can get there, right? Um, Twitter.net docs. Whoops. Twitter. Wrong one. Here we go. .net docs show. The .net docs show. 
I'm on Twitch. I'm not even on the right thing. I can't even pull it up. Anyways, so we have, we have, I promise we have a, a Twitter account. Uh, but when we created the account, um, one of the things that we had done and it, it started getting kind of popular, there's people following it and retweeting. And we actually had like, you know, some of our first uh, tweets, you know, we had like 15,000 impressions and it was uh, a decent little uh, account to start off with. Um, <laughs> but me being one of the owners of it, I, uh, I accidentally set the birth date because it's like, well, if you want to ever get verified, you have to set the birth date for the account. And I'm like, well, we just started the show back in February. So let's put the date there, you know, February. And then immediately Twitter gave me this angry uh, screen. And it's like, well, your account's locked out. You cannot go back into it. Uh, you have to plead your case. Uh, you cannot, you have to be 18 years or older to have a Twitter account. I'm like, what? Like, come on. So we, I basically locked our account out for like two and a half or three weeks or something like that. And it was just, yeah, totally ghosted. So that's what happened. We learned a lesson. We learned that birth dates do truly mean birth dates, even though it's a brand account. So. <laughs> yep. Um, the one thing I would say is sort of a call to action for folks who are tuned in right now. If you are doing something interesting at work, uh, with .NET, um, consider proposing that topic for the .NET Doc Show. Mm -hmm. Come on and just chat with the three of us um, about whatever it is that you're doing. Um, believe it or not, we are just three ordinary dudes who like to talk .NET. Nothing, Absolutely. nothing um, special about us. We were doing exactly what you were doing at some point in our careers. Uh, David, if you could just pull up the website and show how you could propose a topic yeah, uh, absolutely. that might be useful. Yeah. So if you are in the website, um, we have uh, a couple different ways to do it. So you can just go from the routes, there's an ideas tab and that'll take you to where you can submit like a general idea. Uh, this is like an improvement for anything within the website. In fact, we had one of uh, the uh, prolific um blog aggregators out there reach out to us and they said, here's an idea. We'd love to have an RR, uh, RSS feed. So we created that. So now we have that available. Um, but if we go back to upcoming shows, uh, any of the available dates uh, in the future, we will show individual cards for those. So for example, if you're like, well, you know, January 25th, I don't have anything going on. You can submit a topic and it's specific to that individual date. You can give a title, an idea, your first and last name, email, the recaptcha, amazingness, uh, your Twitter handle, and away you go. And, and just to set some context, the, the stream that we do is pretty informal, a lot like this that we've just done here, uh, where like what we're envisioning is you would play Dave and we would play, well, us and ask you questions and, and have you, you know, talk through it and so forth. Absolutely. The other thing I would say is uh, if you do choose to uh, come on the show and uh, share whatever it is you're doing with .NET, you may or may not get the three of us. We have added two additional hosts to the show. Uh, Myra Wenzel, who is a senior PM that runs the .NET uh, customer website. Uh, we've also got Cecil Phillip, who is one of our Azure cloud advocates uh, with a focus on .NET. Uh, so yeah. Uh, trying to keep some fresh faces uh, hosting the show. And uh, again, I hope that someone out there chooses to join us. Awesome. Yeah, that's it. That's all I've got. Hopefully uh, this was uh, something you could learn from and um, we look forward to hearing from you guys in the future. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. So, so Jason, did you have uh, anything else you wanted to let your members know before we conclude? Uh, not at this time. I think uh, we'll have a, another meeting next I've month. I've got your meetup and, URL uh, scrolling on the bottom there. Nice. Sure. Thank you. I'll probably move the date because there's the .NET Conf coming up, which is, uh, we should probably cover that as a big event coming up with uh, .NET 5 and some other things of that nature. So we're going to be doing a, a .NET Conf event. We'll be listed on their site and uh, probably uh, and that's the um, November 10th through the 12th and our talk our, pr our presentation will be at so sometime after that so awesome Stay tuned
Well, thank you so much for having us on. Uh, it was a blast. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you around. Take care.